So here we go. Thanks, Casey. Mm -hmm. Hello, everyone. We're just taking a couple minutes for all of the participants to come into the Zoom webinar. And we'll get started in a minute or so. Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the fourth and final Lunch and Learn session of Swope Health's um, Women's History Month series. My name is Angela Smart. I am the Chief Development Officer for Swope Health, and I am super excited to be joined today by Nikki Lee Donawa. Nikki is the Chief Community Relations Officer for University Health um, that we formerly knew as um, Truman Medical Centers. But Nikki is um, really an expert in community building, and that's why we've invited her to um, talk with us today. At University Health, she provides strategic direction in community health education, along with workforce development and partnership development to position the two campuses of University Health as leaders in creating sustainable models to improve the health of the community. And in addition to community relations, as a member of the University Health executive team, Nikki is responsible for demonstrating sound financial practices and operational effectiveness through budget planning and management. She oversees a large number of areas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she oversees food and nutritional services, retail and banking services, volunteer management, and is a staff participant in the Joint Conference and Quality Committee. She also sits on the University Health Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Leadership Committee and is the executive sponsor for the Black Employee Resource Group. So welcome, Nikki. We hoped that you might just kind of dive in and share with the group um, some of your thoughts on, you know, your personal experiences um, through your career and at University Health, you know, really with the lens of discussing the importance of Black women leadership in healthcare. And um, with that, just would invite you to take it away. Thank you, Angela. I'm pretty excited to be here today, and I want to um, give a shout out to Jaren and Swope Health. Uh, thank you for the opportunity and for hosting uh, Women's Month series. Uh, thanks to Deron McGee, who invited me to be a panelist. I thought he was tricking me at first because I saw those heavy hitters that came before me, and uh, <laughs> I was like, really? <laughs> But, you know, um, but then I heard God say, you know what, Nikki, uh, this is not about you. So um, I have a message for someone and whoever you are out there. I hope it resonates with you. Um, so one of the reoccurring things that I did hear uh, from the women that have gone before me, though, that they were either the first uh, black and or first black woman to have a seat at the table. And that is so important to me. You know, we all hear about tokenism and of course it is real, but in my mind, um, you know what, if you're given a seat and you do nothing with it, then yes, it is tokenism. But if you take that seat and, you know, add your voice to it and you do that on behalf of your community, then right on. Um, I love it. Uh, so, so if you're okay with it, I'll start by sharing a few facts about University Health. 
Absolutely. And, and for great. those of you that know me, if I sound a little lispy, <laughs> I do have a retainer in, and I decided I'm not going to let that stop me either today. So bear yeah. with me. <laughs> um, so let's talk about University Health. So this past year, University Health provided $90 million in uncompensated care. And that's more than all other Kansas City hospitals combined, more than any other hospital in the state. So it is true. We care for individuals with the best insurance and no insurance at all every day. And to learn a little bit more about our payer mix, I thought I'd share a little bit about how we are positioned, excuse me, positioned compared to um, other hospitals. So 54% of our business was traditionally Medicaid and self-pay as compared to 27% for the traditional hospital. Um, now, since the expansion of Medicaid, uh, that has improved. 54% is Medicaid, 12% is self-pay, uh, and we made it our mission to enroll over 15,000 individuals into Medicaid. So what that means to us financially is instead of getting three cents on the dollar, it's now 43 cents on the dollar for Medicaid. Much better, but not nearly enough, <laughs> but we'll take it. Um, University Health is also a teaching hospital. Uh, we provide academic medicine for all. And so we see a lot more patients with concurrent chronic conditions. So we handle some of the most difficult cases and that's what being academic medical center means. Um, individuals that are doing research and knowing the most cutting edge uh, in how we treat our patients is so important. And uh, we have 600 plus medical students and 350 plus resident physicians who have trained at University Health and that happens every year. Uh, they go on to various places in the city and the region and uh, we're pretty proud of that. Um, we are a level one trauma center. So our staff is trained to do more extensive care to those who have life excuse me, life-threatening injuries um, and that might be a traumatic car crash, a violent trauma, a blunt trauma, or a brain injuries. And, and I do want to emphasize that. So it's, it's more than just violent trauma. You know, we are a safety net hospital. Uh, unfortunately, we've sometimes gotten that wrap up being the knife and gun club, as I've heard it called in the streets. But the reality of it is uh, that's a small percentage of what we do car crashes, workplace accidents, uh, falls, et cetera, they're much more prevalent in number. So we're the busiest level one trauma center in Kansas City, Missouri. 1,500 trauma activations in FY22. So it's, it's no wonder why police and firefighters say, take me to University Health for trauma. Um, we're prepared. We are also the regional center for childbirth. Um, we had 3,059 births in FY22, and that's nearly half of all births in Kansas City, Missouri. I know, right? So brand new level three NICU that supports babies requiring uh, intensive care. We've got a renovated mom baby unit uh, providing the latest in security and technology. And what makes us unique is that care coordination that we have with Children's Mercy. So there is a literal bridge that we call the Bridge of Hope, where high-risk moms and babies can easily be transported from uh, one location to the other. And that's important. You know, when minutes count um, and you can literally grab those patients and roll them across the bridge versus waiting on uh, a responder, it really does matter. So people choose us because of that. They go past other hospitals just because of that. So we appreciate it. Um, that's just one of the things we are doing to support our moms and babies. Uh, we also offer a teen mom clinic. Um, we also have a labor of love app that allows women to uh, go on basically and provide uh, childbirth and newborn education for those people using cell phones. Uh, we have a program called Elevate. Um, this program offers group support for education uh, and for pregnant women, excuse me, education. And these sessions are uh, ones that focus on self-care, behavioral health, and we provide car seats and pack and plays. And they're 90-minute sessions. Um, 
and everybody's able to establish a relationship with other pregnant women. So that's pretty important too. You get a chance to have a tribe, if you will. Um, and then we also have a program called Food Pharmacy. That's farm with an F. <laughs> and this is uh, part of our uh, community health strategies and innovation groups uh, program. Uh, they address chronic disease and food insecurity. So it's a 12 to 15 week long uh, program delivered by the team. Uh, they provide uh, recipes and uh, just general edu education about the importance of nutrition during your pregnancy. So we, we really appreciate them for that program as well. A uh, few more facts. We're the largest behavioral health provider in the metro. 66 inpatient beds, 11 outpatient locations, and more than 192 clinic visits. Um, and we're not the only, we're not only the largest. I mean, we're, I think we're pretty good at it. Uh, so uh, we're appreciative uh, that Congress, excuse me, Congressman Cleaver and Senator Blunt uh, teamed up to provide dollars uh, for us for an upcoming project called the Center for Recovery and Wellness. That will expand what we're able to do with people who suffer from substance abuse. And we want people to get their lives back, reconnect with their families and, and become self-sufficient. Um, the need is, is great and overwhelming. Um, healthy community makes all the difference in the world. So, um, Can I ask a quick question? About sure. That? Will that actually be a new building on your main campus? It will be a new building on our main campus. Fantastic. Yes. We have nowhere else to put anyone right now, Angela. Right. <laughs> we are, you know, it would be great if that wasn't such a dire need, but I think we know uh, the prevalence of mental health and, and substance abuse in, in our community. And it's not just our community, it's, it's nationwide, but um, yes, we want to do all that we can to help. Um, and then a little bit about COVID. Um, so remember that we are not wearing masks today, woo, woo. at least when we're not in our patient areas uh, right now. So we're pretty excited about that. But uh, we were the essential hospital in Kansas City, and we took the lead, I believe, on that uh, uh, issue to address COVID-19 in our community. And whether that was providing thousands of masks for our community members, churches, testing and education, vaccines, um, even the follow-up care for those suffering from long haulers COVID. We rose to the occasion and became a catalyst for change. Um, so setting up those clinic models uh, uh, for others to replicate and to reach even more community members was so important. Uh, and, and that's what equitable care means to us. You know, you, you do have to devise new ways to meet community needs. And so it was a little untraditional to find ourselves over in the community center over at Morningstar setting up a clinic, um, or whether it was St. James's community uh, hall or basement, wherever. Uh, it just needed to happen, and so uh, we made it. So uh, we delivered over 147,000 vaccines, 280,000 tests, and um, kind of broke down that information barrier for individuals who might not uh, have access to a computer, or even if they did, when the CDC put information out, it, it wasn't always understandable, um, addressed the need for our seniors, um, you know, where they were telling everybody, go to this website if you want to get, you know, in line for your shot. Well, they're like, website, computer, the what? So we made sure there was a phone line in place, and that's part of our role is to know what the community needs and try to bring that back to our hospital and um, and make it so. But I will mention, we couldn't have done it without everybody else, partners. And I mean, everybody played a role in this. Um, you know, I, I know that Swope did and and Sam and, um, and Reverend Miles called in the National Guard. And I mean, you know, everybody had a part to that. And, and if I don't have any other legacy while I'm in healthcare, um, that mattered to me. We saved lives. We saved black and brown lives. Um, so can't speak for everybody else, but it matters. Um, so, uh, Nikki, I'm so glad you kind of brought up that moment. It's it's reminding me of the incredible role that Truman played at that moment. I do remember that 
you were providing um, healthcare professionals, frontline workers with vaccinations and um, you know, appropriate to the order, you were following the rules for who got the vaccine and when. But I remember even just a lot of people working at nonprofits who worked in a client facing role were able to come to Truman and get that first vaccination and how important that was. Mm-hmm. It, it absolutely was, uh, Indolin. You know, we had um, we we had the luxury of setting up a clinic that could move volumes of people. That was critical. Um, we had the luxury of having a team of people that we could take to the community and support people where they were in their own backyards. Uh, incredible partnerships. KCATA, Ride KC, uh, they worked with us to provide transportation from different housing areas. Um, and because it takes individuals and agencies in the community that have an audience uh, that maybe not all of us serve, you know, we had to have we had those partnerships. We had them with the Urban League, you know, we had them with Reverend Williams over at Seacon and Reverend Hartsfelds and, you know, um, the kids over at Arts Tech, you know, they were out, you know, drumming up, you know, information for students and, and uh, seniors within their household alike. So it, it was a big deal. Yeah, I'd love, I'd love to say it's gone, uh, but thank God it has subsided. <laughs> um, and so we've made it through. It was like 10 years in two, Angela. It was, that's right it was. that's right it it um it's remarkable to think that that was you know three years ago in many respects it seems like it was about 15 years ago I know right I know <laughs> yeah. right 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 so I, I will say that um you know we we hope to close uh more gaps on healthcare disparities um we know it's real and um uh, one of the things I know we're addressing is race-based practices and our commitment to health equity, um, and that is around CKD, uh, chronic kidney disease. It's uh, one of the more common chronic conditions we treat at University Health, and the disparity is uh, in this particular condition is experienced, unfortunately, by our Black population. Um, there's several figures to raise uh, that concern and show that a significant uh, detection, treatment, and outcome in disparities exist between Black patients living with CKD. Um, and some of the stats are Black patients are three times more likely to require a renal replacement uh, therapy and kidney transplants. Um, black patients have a 7.6% lifetime risk for in-cage excuse me, in-stage kidney disease compared to 1.7% uh, for white patients. Um, two times likely, uh, less likely to receive a living donor uh, for kidney transplant and spend two times longer on dialysis, uh, maybe than their white counterparts. So um, that's something that we really wanna help to close the gap on. And so in May of last year, our um, equity, diversity, and inclusion team worked with nephrology, laboratory, billing and coding departments, along with our advanced practice, excuse me, practice educators. And they collaborated to cease the use of EGFR equation and implement creatinine cysteine C tests as a primary measure to detect kidney diseases. Um, and these tests are more accurate and have been validated by specialists in this area of medicine. Uh, and since making this transform transformation, our specialists report an increased number of black patients referred for kidney care, more accurate detection in previously tested black patients and earlier detection of disease in black patients. And the data is currently being constructed to provide greater and more granular insight into the efficacy of this approach. Um, we're pretty excited about that. We also partner with another um, community agency, uh, Jackson County, Missouri chapter of Links Incorporated and uh, the American Jazz Museum. And so we uh, paid some special attention to our musicians in the community. So we'll be having an upcoming, what we call the Sound of Healthy program where we get together and do a lunch and learn with some of the musicians in our community. Uh, their lifestyles don't always can, uh, 
condone to the best of uh, health conditions. And so um, that we want to play our part in our own backyard to help support these individuals. And so anything that we could do to help close the gap, um, we're willing to try it. So. It sounds like the work that you're doing in the chronic kidney disease area really is kind of national model type of work. Are you um, sharing, are you partnering at a national level with anybody to share what you learn? You know, I don't know that we're uh, partnering at a national level. I'm not, um, I'm not aware that we are, but we possibly are because I get my information from my colleagues a lot of times. Um, I do know that we were recognized locally uh, for our efforts. And so um, because we are linked in with the Missouri Hospital Association and the American uh, Hospital Association, um, most of us are either a part of a group or a committee in some form or another. So I can't imagine that right. we're not sharing. Yeah. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so we got to, we, we, we do a lot, but not without our challenges. Uh, you know, <laughs> the cost of doing business keeps increasing. Um, you know, we're, we're dealing with as many uh, staffing issues as everybody else. 900 positions, we, open positions, we used to have about 450. So you can imagine what that's like. Our, our, it affects our revenues. Um, but you know what? We're going to keep going <laughs> um, and do the best we can with what we've got. So it, it's a... Um... It's a problem that Swope Health is experiencing as well. And mm -hmm. I know we have a number of Swope Health associates um, on the call today. You know, our numbers have to scale your numbers way back to kind of get to where Swope Health is. But, um, it, you know, it, it's a tough problem to solve because it takes time. You know, we're going to mm -hmm. need to get more people trained and credentialed and certified and, you know, creating a pipeline of people who want to come work in, you know, whether it's an FQHC setting or a community hospital setting. Um, so we, we've got work to do as a community yes. in this area. Yeah, we, we do. And, you know, you look at uh, healthcare trends across the nation, it, you know, it's changed, you know, COVID right. was, right. it was the great disruptor. Um, and so when you think about even healthcare models, um, it's going to look a lot different probably within the next uh, five to 10 years. Mm -hmm. It's we can't go back to doing business like we used to. So, um, yeah, it's a it's a storm to weather right now. But uh, I, you know, I, I just believe that one of the things we work toward doing is more pre preventative care. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, of course, we need to be here for the sickest of sick. But. We definitely want to do our part to be advocates for individuals that um, that might need additional education and support in order to be their own advocate when they're seeking health care. So, yeah. yeah. Um, Nikki, would you be willing to share with us just a little bit more personal information, like where you grew up, where you went to school, um, where you were before university health? Um, we'd love to hear that. Sure, sure. Yeah. So um, I grew up in a small town, uh, just an hour east of here, Higginsville, Missouri. Okay. Uh, population yeah. 5,000. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the um, uh, I, I am married, by the way, I am married okay. and have two children, uh, oh, a son named Nasser. My daughter's name is Claire. Nasser lives in Kuwait with his family. Uh, Claire is a student at the Kansas City Art Institute. And uh, and my mom is here in town with us um, and lives with us. So a uh, little bit of the personal information. So growing up in Higginsville, Missouri was a little unique um, for me. <laughs> I've always felt like a city person, but uh, I guess I'm a country girl at heart. Um, Kansas City was where we came to do the things that we couldn't find in Higginsville, Missouri, you know, come to get our, our, our hair did, as we say. And uh, <laughs> you know, and go to the Hitch and Post and Wild Woody. And so uh, we, we know a lot of parts of the city um, just from being here, family and friends living here. Um, but it was definitely different. You know, Higginsville's a 90% uh, white town, 5% black, 5% um, other. And so it was uh, formerly the site of the Missouri Confederate Soldiers Home. 
So that site was home to 1,600 Civil War soldiers, you know, and their families for almost 60 years. So you, you can imagine uh, in 1860, Lafayette County is where it is, had the largest slave population, uh, about over 6,000 slaves. And it's, ain't that a kicker? Um, so <laughs> just that, that history alone, you know, while we don't live in our past, you know, uh, that that history does shape us into who we are. I do believe that. And so, you know, growing up, I can't say that I fully understood segregation. You know, when you're in a small footprint like that, there's only so many places you can live, right? And I know about redlining and the dividing uh, line here in Kansas City and how that's impacted so many uh, people in this community. And we didn't feel that as much. Now, the racism existed, don't get me wrong. <laughs> but... Um, you know, we tend to live in a more integrated type community. Um, and so it was just a little bit different um, for us. But nevertheless, we understood our, our place and our role, um, understood our, our Blackness and what it meant to uh, living in a small town like that, and seeing what it also meant once we moved to a larger city. So quite, quite different. I went to school at um, the, my undergrad at Central Missouri State University, and my uh, master's I did at Baker University. And I did not take a traditional route to healthcare at all. I, I didn't grow up wanting to be in healthcare. You know what? I so admire those people. I think I was listening to Judge Hardwick. She always knew she wanted to be a lawyer. You know, I grew up knowing she was. I had no clue. I had no clue at all, Angela. Um, so I found myself taking a path of retail. I worked retail, which I really, you know, for any young person out there, don't knock it. Uh, it's a it's a world of experience that I think everyone should at least have. You you get to know people, you talk to people, you get business, you uh, customer service. It's, it's bar none. I mean, get the experience any way you can. But that's how I started. I started retail, found myself uh, uh, in settings again, where I was the only woman, only black woman, even in a small town. You know, it doesn't seem like it's been that long ago, but growing up, I can remember saying, I want to work in one of the stores, you know, on Main Street. <laughs> that's it, Main Street kind of thing. And I remember... Uh, several people kind of laughing at me and saying, oh, really, you think so? Because they don't really let us work in the store. You know, <laughs> we might be able to clean the store, but we don't get to work in the store. Uh, but, you know, into my kind of, that's just a challenge for me. You know, I mean, I'm like, okay, we're going to make this happen. Uh, so that was part of my history making. I was the first black female to work in a retail store, you know, in Higginsville, Missouri. Um, doesn't seem like a big deal in most people's eyes, but for me, it was a big deal. Um, came to Kansas City eventually and did my internship in Gucci on the plaza. I don't know if you remember Gucci when it was there. I, and that was <laughs> I don't, but that's amazing. <laughs> that was another crazy incident. You know, I just march in and say I want a job. I'm like, we're not hiring. Well, let's talk about that. That's <laughs> so, great. So I got a chance to uh, manage a Gucci Gucci store and um and then from there, found myself in other retail stores on the plaza and eventually at Hallmark Cards. That was uh, one of my first career moves, if you will. Stayed at Hallmark Cards for nearly 13 years. And um, during that time, I um, got pregnant with my daughter and decided when she was turning, uh, about to turn five, I thought, I want to go home. Yeah, I got to spend time with this baby. I get to know this girl, you know. <laughs> She's getting ready to go off to... Uh, preschool. And so I did just that after nearly 13 years. Um, and then she went off to uh, preschool and I thought, Lord Jesus, they're going to have to lock me up. I cannot clean this house one more time. I've got to go do something. And so um, I was encouraged to seek out an opportunity in real estate. So, you know, um, one of the things that I learned about it is about new home communities and um, wasn't privy to knowing that prior to actually going through the school and the training. So I thought, you know what, I want to do new home sales. Um, and this broker literally came to me once I passed my test and said, hey, we'd love for you to join the team. 
And I thought, oh, great. And then find out they're a new home uh, broker firm. I'm like, oh, this is great. So I thought, I went in and I said, yeah, I want to do a new home community. They were like, er, nope. <laughs> no. <laughs> nope, nope, nope. You, you're too young at this. No experience. You know? oh, like, yeah. yeah. But once again, you didn't see people that look like me in okay. the communities. Um, you know, so, so I decided to go a different path. And uh, I started to do things to support the new home communities that were in um, in motion. I'm down to the city trying to get things approved for curbs and lighting. And, you know, I'm just gonna, you know what? And hey, by the way, here's a little marketing plan I just pulled together. Um, so needless to say, that was an interesting career. And I worked with about eight different builders and um, and ended up working in three different new home communities. Wow, so, great. Yeah. yeah, I know, I know it's pretty cool. So not a traditional path. I. Yeah. I it was honestly at that time that someone called me from another hospital system and invited me to come in and wanted to talk to me about a position. And that's when I thought they've got to be crazy because I don't know anything about healthcare and I didn't have a true interest in it either. I'll be honest. And, mm -hmm. and I said that to them and they were like, well, but you know what? It's not about your um, knowledge and experience in healthcare. Uh, it's a different type of role. And they knew my experience from Hallmark cards. And so I went in, that's how I ended up in healthcare. That's where I started. Mm -hmm. I started working with the department, um, doing more of the PR kind of um, marketing, physician referral and recruitment, that kind of deal. And somebody found me from there and bought me over to, at that time, Truman Medical Centers. And here I am, almost 13 years in. Wow. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, thank so. you for sharing all that. That is a an incredible career with a lot of variety of, of fun experiences, interesting experiences yeah. that have gotten you where you are today. When you were working in the um, new developments, did you ever live in a new home that was part of an area that you were selling? Um, I did, but it wasn't because of me doing real estate at the time. Okay. Um, you know, I... Um, my fiance ended up moving here. He was fiance at the time we got married and um, they were building homes in the Northland. And so that's where we ended up buying, but that was long before I got into real estate. Okay. Um, it was, tr it was difficult to find a new home in the Midtown area. I mean, right. so we didn't know where else to, to, to look. And the thing about it is after graduating college and moving to Kansas City, that's all I knew was Midtown. You yeah. know, I, I spent time yeah, over yeah. in Troost and Armour. So that was that was home for me. So it did feel a little odd to mm -hmm. go north <laughs> for mm -hmm. home. Um, but we did. And um, it's been great. You know, um, my daughter's had a good uh, experience in schools in the Northland. But yeah. and then there I go, end up selling homes in new communities in the Northland. So, yeah. yeah. And um, do you all still live in the Northland? Mm -hmm. we yeah. do okay yeah. we do um I would love to migrate back to Midtown that's my mm -hmm. uh, goal eventually yeah um have a lot of respect for my mom who's with us like I mentioned and um she's familiar with her surroundings and very comfortable in where we are and so that's just what we do for mamas sure. we, we love them yeah. until we'll stay there until <laughs> um uh, until it's time for us to move back to Midtown so yeah, yeah. good Good. I wish my kids were on this call so they could hear you say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, you know what? There's an allegiance that we make and we keep it. You know, we, we can't yeah. throw ours away. So yeah, good. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, another question for you, just in terms of um, thinking back on mentors, people that have influenced you, made a difference in your life. Um, who who comes to mind as um, somebody who was really influential in mentoring you through the years? Uh, so many, yeah. really. I mean, there's been so many wonderful women that have um, either are still in my life or have come and gone. Um, sometimes people are only in your life for a season and um, it doesn't matter how long they've been there. Sometimes people just make an impact uh, for a short period of time even. Um, but I grew up in a household of strong black women. So my great aunt, my grandmother, my mother herself, and, you know, my aunt who I learned was a nurse at 
general too, before I even started mm -hmm. working at Truman Medical Centers had an influence in my life. So, um, and then for people in career wise, um, there's some of the colleagues that I work with every day. And mm -hmm. I do think that people think of mentorship in a maybe a more traditional or formal way. And I don't. It's the women who have a seat at the table and they champion on your behalf. You know what? They bring your name up um, and they support what you do. People in the community, um, wonderful, wonderful voices in the community that have supported me. I, I hate to name names because I normally leave somebody out. Yeah. Um, yeah. But just wonderful people. I think of, um, I do have somebody that's kind of special though, uh, Janice Nunley. Uh, who's married to um, Jim Nunley. Um, I just, I admire um, women that even if they don't still work in their profession, they have such a leadership role in the community and you might not even see them on TV or, or wherever, um, but they have that strong, silent leadership. Um, and I'm impressed by that. Um, I'll name a few folks here at uh, University Health, Ruth Pullins for one. Mm -hmm. She's been a great supporter. She's our chief HR officer here. Um, Cece Rojas has been a wonderful mentor and a friend for me in the community. Debbie Ballard. I know I, keep, I start naming people and I'm, I know I'm not going <laughs> to you know, Mamie Hughes, George Clark. I could, this, I could go on and on and on, but they're, they're all women that are leaders in their own right. And uh, it's one of the things that I, I encourage for young women out there to know that you know, you're enough. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be anybody but you. Mm -hmm. uh, you're the only one with your, one with your DNA. Uh, you know, nobody else got your fingerprint. So do thank what you're you called for, to do. Yeah, <laughs> do thank you for called. reminding us all mm -hmm. of that, of that important message. Mm -hmm. um, I think everybody on the call, you know, deserves and should hear that. And I, I I think somebody's going to call you after and say, "Hey, how come you didn't mention me as a mentor?" So hopefully, I didn't get you into that. <laughs> into that charge, it, charge it to my head and not my heart. You know, right. I, uh, right. you know, if, if I kept going, and you'd be like, "Okay, Nikki, that's enough. That's enough." <laughs> <laughs> um, as you think about um, being a mom and raising kids, are you? encouraging either of your children to look at um, a career in healthcare? Mm, excuse me, I her mouth. Uh, no, I'll, no, I'll okay. be honest. And yeah. not because it's a uh, poor choice. It's a wonderful career. Mm -hmm. um, I just think that we should all chart our own paths. Right. Mm -hmm. And if it's an interest of theirs, absolutely. Um, but if not, uh, no, because like I said, I didn't really have mine planned out. Um, right. And I'm kind of one of those firm believers of, you know, that my steps are ordered by God. And so some of the, most of the jobs I've had, I didn't choose them. I didn't go looking for so many of them and they, they found me. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I believe I know why I'm here, <laughs> uh, what I'm here for, at least in this period in time. And who knows what's next? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, it, it's hard with kids. You have to really encourage them to keep their hearts and minds open and, and follow their own dreams, not their not their parents' dreams. <laughs> right. Well, you, you know what? You know when you're in the right place, you make a difference. Right. Right. For sure. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it all works. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I would invite everybody who's on the call, The um, I believe that the chat is closed, but there's a Q&A function. If anybody has any questions that they would like to ask um, Nikki today, we can um, pull those together through that Q&A. And um, Nikki, I know we were talking just a little bit um, before the webinar, but about your your love and interest in music. So tell oh, us a little bit about that too. I do, I love 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 music, yeah. all genres of music. Honestly, there's none that I don't like. Maybe maybe not the whole acid rock thing. I never <laughs> did get into that. Uh, but you know, you hear me listening to James Brown, Aretha Franklin, uh, Fleetwood Mac, and you know, yeah, Kenny G. You, I mean, I could just go on all about right. that too. Uh, but it inspires me. 
um, I didn't grow up with my biological father, but I did get a chance to meet him and learned a lot about him. And he was a musician. And I'm thinking, that must be where I got it from. Um, but, you know, that's just, it, it really does. It motivates me, um, helps me clear my mind when I'm in kind of a funky mood too. And so, um, and and I will tell you, now my favorite genre of music, and a lot of people don't agree with me, is rap. Okay, okay. I love rap. Yeah. I love hip hop. Anybody knows Biggie Smalls, you put on a little hypnotize and I'm there. Um, <laughs> and that's uh, maybe not as traditional for what you'd call a professional person. But, you know, for me, um, hip hop goes beyond the lifestyle that I think people see individuals living and they created a path for themselves. You know, when when the system wasn't working for them, they did create their own system. Um, I don't know that they would be in the millions and billions of dollars in the industry had they have tried to do that traditional walk down a path that was created right. for them. And so, yeah. yeah, that system wasn't made for them. Yeah, yeah. So I love that. Yeah. Do you listen in your office? Sometimes I do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I got to tell you, I, I'm a little too busy to <laughs> in my car now. When I get in the car, it's all right, but right. <laughs> in the office, not so much. Not so I much. do like to sometimes listen in my office, but then people will walk by and say, what's that noise? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know you're doing the interviewing, but what's yours? Yeah. What's yeah. your favorite music? Do you listen to music? Yeah, I, I do. I feel like I'm, um, I hate to sort of date, date myself and my age, but I am a real um, fan of 80s and 90s music of all types across mm -hmm. genres. But, you know, when you listen to that song and it kind of takes you back to your fun times of high school or, you know, certain songs remind me of my mom or my dad and, you know, mm -hmm. those kind of nostalgic um, songs. I also love uh, Fleetwood Mac and Stevie Nicks and ABBA and, um, oh, I, we, we have a little mini Prince fan club over here. Um, oh, yeah. You know, <laughs> you're a, a Prince fan, but um, yeah. Life yeah. Prince fan too. Um, we do have several questions that have come up in the q and A. I I want to say from A. Hawkins. Hello, Nikki Lee. Great to see you. And I think that's Angela Hawkins. <laughs> yes. We go way back. <laughs> and then um, Chris Pena here at Swope Health says, FYI, I met Biggie when I lived in New York City. Shut up. <laughs> Oh my gosh, Chris, awesome. let's get together. <laughs> um, and I have a, a really good question here that might take a minute or two. Um, would love to know um, how University Health fosters a culture of equity and inclusion in the workplace. Do they have employee resource groups? And if so, how do those work? Mm, absolutely, we do. Um, we do have um, an equity, diversity, and inclusion um, staff, for one, and then the employee research groups. Um, we have a Black ERG, a women's ERG, an LGBTQ okay. ERG, um, yeah. and, and it is, you know what, I'll have to say this. So I remember uh, when diversity was a thing you know, um, back in the day. And so what it meant is that you at least had a black person, you know, in the role. Um, and we would maybe have fried chicken in the cafeteria on MLK day. And then we have, uh, you know, <laughs> tacos or, you know, Cinco de Mayo. Uh, we've come a long way. Um, yeah, right. We really have. And so it means so much to have the representation, yes, of every group, uh, but then it's also bringing everybody together so that they understand the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And you can't you can't take that out of healthcare. I mean, I, I know how you could, you shouldn't, right? You know, anyway. You, um, right. you know, and and here's another thing. So growing up, I'm in this small white town. My physician was white. Mm -hmm. 
I didn't know any different. Great physician. I, I, I don't even know if he was supposed to be making house calls, but he made house calls to our wow. house. Okay. Yeah. You know, when I was sick or anybody yeah. in the family was sick. So fast forward to today. Yes, ideally, we would love to have all of our physicians look like us, our nurses look like us, but unfortunately, it's not realistic. And so when they don't, you rely on that person of another race, color, ethnicity to still provide you with culturally competent care. Right. And that's what this group and this staff is. These groups are here for that, Mm -hmm. to help educate and nurture, you know, that sentiment across the organization Um, because it doesn't happen naturally, unfortunately, and it has to be intentional. Mm -hmm. It has to be very intentional. So Mm -hmm. I'm pretty proud of the things that we're doing uh, and the progress that we're making. And it's one of the reasons why I shared the information about the CKD um, program and the way we're addressing things there. Um, we're, We're pulling the data we're making the data available so we can make the changes that we need to make. Right. Yeah. Terrific. So. I am an, another question. Do, do you have any examples of a time that you faced adversity while developing your career? And if so, how did you overcome it? Um, yeah. Um, I think there was, um, there was always that barrier. I mean, it, any any job that I had interest in, unless they did come looking for me, that was me knocking on that door and I didn't look like anybody else there. Right, okay. That in itself was um, mm-hmm. yeah. an obstacle, yes. you know? And um, really the way I overcame it was to basically share why I was the right person for the job Mm -hmm. ask for a chance I mean I figured you know what's the worst could happen if I don't have a job now I'll be out of another one (laughs) soon again (laughs) but um, that's one of the things and then the other thing also is I think just having a real strong belief in yourself yeah I mean again I can't stress enough how important it is to not compare yourself to anybody else. Um, It's so easy to do. It's Mm -hmm. so easy to uh, think, well, if I just had there, and if I just had gone to this, and if I just, you know, maybe that would have put me in a better position. Mm -mm. No, do yourself, keep work and work. It, it's work, work. It, mm-hmm. is, <laughs> it is work it's it's not necessarily always fun um but uh and surround yourself with people that are smarter than yourself I did that is so important um I'm never the sharpest knife in the drawer but I know who to go to <laughs> uh I know who to go and surround yourself with people that support you and believe in you yes so, um yeah. Potential's a big deal. Yes. You know, a lot of people see in you what you don't see in yourself. And so, you know, you work up to that. Right. So, yeah. I am. And we keep it to just one or two more questions, but we have a question from um, Dr. Janice Love, who often is the facilitator on our Swope Health Lunch and Learn calls. So yes. Janice, I want your feedback afterward. <laughs> but she <laughs> says, first of all, Nikki, You are phenomenal. She can't wait to share your story with her daughter who is in retail. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. And (laughs) she asked, did you ever, as a professional woman with a busy schedule, have to deal with mommy guilt when you had to choose between work and children? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, and yes, and yes. (laughs) Right. (laughs) You know, because I've been one of those people that, I've always been involved in community stuff. Um, I I served on way too many committees and probably sat on way too many boards. And um, and I I should say I didn't, I didn't really fall into this role, but I know I ended up in in this role as a community relations person because of the large network of people yeah. that I accumulated over the years. Which means I didn't go home. Mm-hmm a lot you know and for people that 
say they're interested in community engagement and sometimes they'll ask, well, what do you think we need to, uh, don't go home. Uh, you know, I mean, my day could yeah. start with an eight o'clock meeting and it might end up at 10 o'clock at night mm -hmm. because I was going to meet people all throughout the day, whether it was at a luncheon, an evening event, um, you know, and or I'll just be transparent on a bar stool down at <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it, it, it did breed some mommy guilt, but I did learn that I had the support of my family. Mm -hmm my mom, my husband. Um, and here's the other thing I'll say. When my daughter was young, I just tried to be at the most important impactful parts of her life. So yeah. I couldn't go to maybe every school event, but dad blame it. I served on that PTA because I knew <laughs> it made a difference if I showed up how my daughter was going to be treated uh, because I cared then they would care about me caring. Right. Uh, so I definitely did that. And um, when I couldn't be there, my husband was there. Um, that was a little bit easier when she was younger. It was really that transitional stage of going into those teenage years. Yeah. Where I would then say, okay, you know what? I got to pull back because right. now she's this vessel, this vessel who, who's going to be poured into yeah. and it can, either be, it can either be with the right information or the wrong information. So uh, I need to be there for that time. And so my daughter's probably endured a lot. And as a matter of fact, by the time she got to be a teenager, I drug her with me. Mm -hmm. She went to those events with yes. me. She went to those meetings with me and, you know, and I had to go to somebody's house during the AIDS walk patron party. You know what? Come yeah. on, you need, to, you need to learn about this. And she yes. probably hated every minute of it, but, you know, uh, but she but went. Looking back, she probably appreciates it. She understands what, what mom was thinking there. I hope so. You know, and little did I know how uh, much of a difference it can make because that generation they're glued to their cell phones. We all are, but right. they don't, they didn't communicate, yeah. they don't communicate by having conversations for the most part. Yeah. And so while it was a little uncomfortable uh, for her, I'd like to believe that it helped her at least be able to feel a little more comfortable, you know, in having what we call normal conversations. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm sure she loved me for it. <laughs> yeah, mommy guilt for sure. Oh, you, be, you be there when you can and you love them as much as you can. That's right. Impossible, yeah. to, impossible mm. to avoid that. Yeah. Um, I have another message in the Q&A. Um, it comes from Deborah Simpson. Nikki, you have been an inspiration to many women over the years, especially women of color. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for saying so. I do appreciate that. You know, um, it's hard enough for us. Uh, I, I don't understand other women that don't, you know, respect other women. Right. I love that quote that there's a special place in hell for the women who don't respect other women or, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> what is it? A special place in hell for women uh -huh. who don't support other women. Yes. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, it fix another queen's crown. I mean, really, <laughs> we, we end up having so many of the same struggles and, and challenges and um, just try to support one another, yes. honestly. Yep. So, well, good. well I want to leave, leave mm -hmm. the closing, um, closing comments to you. Is there any final um, thing that you would like to add? You've, you've already said so much and so many valuable things and you know, we, we can all leave this call with that important reminder and call to action to believe in ourselves, believe in each other. Um, and and it, it's hard work and it takes work. Um, any other um, kind of final, final closing messages for the group? You know what? I'll close on a health note. Um, it take care of you. You know, I mean, you're what you've got. Um, pour into yourselves um, and don't get caught in that trap of the giving, 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 giving to the point that you're so depleted. Right. That you can't even yeah. help yourself. And I say that to, to women, um, 
go for your primary care visits, go see your gynecologist. <laughs> uh, I mean, really, we can only help people as you know when we're healthy enough to do so. So right. take care of your health. And um, and if you don't have a medical home, Swope's around the corner and so is University Health. So <laughs> thank you for the plug. We're here for you. We're here for you. So <laughs> great. Absolutely. Well, Nikki, we owe you endless gratitude for your generous time and sharing your personal story and sharing some really valuable and meaningful advice today. And I encourage everybody to continue to monitor things going on at Swope Health. Please follow us on social media. It's the best way to kind of stay in touch with our um, events such as this that we'll be putting on throughout the year. And if anything, join us next February for, or next February for Black History Month, next March for Women's History Month again. Thank you, Duran, for putting this together. And I wish everybody a wonderful, sunny Wednesday. Thank, Thank you. you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Nikki. Thanks so much. Thanks. Bye-bye.